Hi, and welcome back for chapter four. In chapter four, we're gonna cover wireless media. So we've been covering copper and fiber optic, which obviously are cables, but now we get to start talking about waves and wireless media. So let's get started. First thing we're gonna glance at is our roadmap scene where we are in the group of this book. So we're about three quarters of the way through our media chapters. So there's four of them, the copper, fiber optic, wireless, and then we'll talk about the encoding and transmission processes. Um, so we're in wireless right now. The first thing to understand with wireless media is that it's going to work in waves. The same way that sound waves work, the light waves are going to be in a wave pattern. There is going to be a singular cycle of a wave and the electromagnetic wave is going to travel through our media, um, our wireless media, um, to be able to get data to you. Understanding that we use the phrase carrier wave. So an electronic wave, electromagnetic, pardon me, an electromagnetic wave of a set frequency used to carry data. We call it a carrier wave because it carries the data. So we take our carrier wave and our data and we mix them together and we create what is called modulation. A couple of terms that you may not have heard or, or you may need to have clarified. So the carrier wave is the electromagnetic wave and the data and the carrier wave put together create modulation. When we take a magnetic wave, it, whether it's radio or television or data, all three essentially use the same kind of concept. We have to have a transmitter and we have to have a receiver. So if you have experience with radio waves or um, video waves, you can understand this concept of there's a certain frequency that it runs at and the transmitter is going to generate the carrier wave by modulating the information into it. It is then going to send it out and it's going to fly across the sky and be received by a receiver. Transmitter, receiver, you have to have both. Transmitter transmits, receiver receives. So the receiver is going to take that wave and take the carrier wave and the data separating them by demodulation. So if modulation is the combination of carrier waves and data, demodulation is the separation of carrier waves and data. So we can pull the data out and no, and the carrier wave just keeps going on in its universe. The bandwidth of the carrier wave is called the channel. So this is like if you log into your login, if you go to your radio and you go to 104.5, um, and you get to a specific channel, that carrier signal is at the channel 104.5 megahertz. And that megahertz refers to the, freak, the, the bandwidth of the carrier signal. Okay, in the image that we have here over on the right, we have the gentleman talking into a microphone. So the voice wave is converted into electrical energy. It's converted into data. And the transmitter, produces the carrier wave and attaches, modulates that data into the transmission. The electrical energy produced by the sound wave is mixed with the carrier wave in the modulation process. Then the receiver accepts that combined wave, demodulates, separates them into data and the carrier wave. And then the speaker converts that um, data into electrical energy into the voice wave. Originally, they actually tried to use infrared, but the problem with infrared, which you may have noticed, is that infrared requires a line of sight. So if you've ever done anything with infrared, you'll find you have to be able to see the, the infrared signal to have that line of sight. So if you had a building or a hill in the way, that's not going to work. So we switched it to this version of using electromagnetic waves. Anything that matches your carrier wave can be considered interference. So your carrier wave is at a certain frequency. We've talked about this. If you have other things running at that same carrier wave, it's going to interfere and it's going to cause static. AM radio was much more susceptible to radio interference than FM, which is why so many things switched over to the FM radio um, signals because they didn't have as much interference of other things running against that same carrier wave. 
the carrier waves are, are managed, are, are um, controlled by the FCC, so the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC. And what they do is they actually divide up the entire electromagnetic spectrum into who gets control of what bandwidth, which, which set of gigahertz, megahertz, um, who's allowed to work in which spectrum. So we kind of separate it into what we call the ISM band, ISM industrial, scientific, and medical. So in our ISM band, we start with our industrial and they get the 900 to 928 megahertz band. So anything that's industrial, you can put in that one and it's gonna essentially work with just industrial because scientific and medical should not be in that band, that, that um, section of frequencies. Scientific gets 2.4 to 2.48 gigahertz. These are in gigahertz, not megahertz. So 2.4 to 2.48 gigahertz. And that's where they exist. This is your 802.11 um, for your routers. They exist in this section. So your 802.11 router, if you go to look at your router right now, like if you stop the video and go over to your router and flip it over, you will find something along the lines of 802.11 B, G, N, something along those lines, which is going to tell you which band that exists in. That 802.11 works in that scientific band between 2.4 and 2.48 gigahertz. Don't forget, we jumped up from megahertz to gigahertz when we went from industrial. So industrial was at 900. Remember, one gigahertz is a thousand megahertz. If you can keep that straight in your head, that'll really, really help. And then after that, we have the 5.725 to the 5.85 gigahertz, which we've separated out for medical. Again, you might have your 802.11 um, A or N in that 5 gigahertz. And we'll talk about that when we start talking about our routers. You might have a 2.4 router and you might have a 5 gigahertz router. Those would be in the different bands where they would exist. So your 2.4 gigahertz router, which are either your Bs, your Gs, or your Ns. Both G and N, or I'm sorry, N can be in both. Um, G is generally in 2.4. Um, a is and N are both in five, but we'll talk about those when we get into routers. The list across the bottom that I have here actually lists out a couple of different devices that use radio waves, remote controls, garage door openers, your TV, obviously radio, satellites, your cell phone, power lines that are done with radio, radar equipment, some motors, fluorescent lights, and obviously many more. So these are all different things that can use wireless radio waves to communicate and therefore you need to be aware of interference. Some of the questions that you're going to find on the test are going to be, there's a microwave, which bandwidth is it interfering with? You have Bluetooth on your monitor, on your uh, keyboard, which bandwidth could cause interference in your room? Could it be your fluorescent lights? Could it be your microwave? Could it be the guy opening the garage door next door? these kind of things. So you want to think about what bandwidth your device is working on. And we'll talk about that, obviously, as we go along. I don't expect you to know the answer yet. Um, but that's something you kind of want to keep in the back of your head when it comes to radio interference. How the data gets passed is in a specific bandwidth. Anything else in that bandwidth can cause interference. So let's give you an example of a couple of different antennas. So there's five different types of antennas that go down the side here. And each of them is just a little different. Yes, the bottom three are pretty similar in their pattern, but they obviously look different. The word omni means in all directions, omnipresent, omnipotent, omnidirectional. The wireless transmitter broadcasts in all directions. It's a big circle. It goes in 360, direct, 360 degrees. And obviously it's a singular pole. Um, the imagery that you see here. The electromagnetic wave pattern that you could see is just all directions going straight out in all directions, 360 degrees. So an omnidirectional. The others are all called directional because they actually limit the directions that the broadcast is in. So a dipole has a singular pole down the middle and then it goes off in two different directions. It broadcasts in the directions of the pole. So it is common for receivers if you know where the broadcast is coming from. You turn it towards where the broadcast is coming from and it will receive from that direction. You don't have to have it look 360 degrees. You know where the antenna is coming from. You know what direction it's coming from. You can set it up that way. We also have a Yagi, 
which is generally a point to point. Again, it's going to be specifically a singular point that it is pointing to. The dipole can go two different directions. The Yagi and the flat panel and the parabolic, they really only go in one. So they go a single direction. So you can see they have a little bit of a wave pattern in the three other directions, but the fourth direction, the direction it's facing, is going to be the one that it uses a lot. Yagis are point to point. They can use radio tubes and they can get progressively larger and that can cause um, some increase in their ability to receive data. Flat panels are great because they can go against the side of a building and you don't have to see it. We like not seeing things. So for aesthetics, it's great. Of course, it also acts like a um, sail because it's flat. So if you have wind load that's blowing on it, it can blow it out of, out of direction and it can blow it in the wrong directions. So having it flat, they're a little bit more susceptible to environmental experiences, the wind, the rain, the storm. We're in Montana, we do those kind of things. Um, so you got to be kind of aware of that when you use a flat panel antenna. And then of course, is your basic satellite parabolic, um, which is also a point to point antenna style. It's got one direction, it goes from point A to point B. Um, but it's kind of like the inside of a flashlight. It does this reflection, which it makes it so that it receives better. If you've ever looked at the inside of a flashlight, it usually has kind of a silver or a reflective lining on the inside. So the light's there, the light can point. Okay, so this is old fashioned light flashlights, not the LED kinds. And then that light gets reflected on the, on the shiny part to make sure that it does more than just the single light by itself. So it does kind of a reflection of the light. Same kind of thing with the way parabolic is designed for their antennas. Okay, a lot going on on this slide. So I'm going to try to take it slow, give you some time to absorb all of the text that's on here. I should have put this in two slides, I apologize, but it all kind of goes together and I kind of wanted it all to be together. I didn't want you to think these were two different concepts. What we're talking about here is how do radio waves get transmitted? The techniques that we use for radio wave transmission. First off, think about radio waves as a frequency from as low as 10 kilohertz all the way up to 3 million megahertz. But generally we work in that 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range because that was the one we talked about, remember with our wireless router, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So we'll talk about those. But generally you can have radio waves as low as 10 kilohertz and as high as 3 million megahertz. So large range that you can do in your radio wave transmissions. We split those into two different versions of transmission, our spread spectrum and our orthogonal frequency divisional multiplexing, which we'll talk about in just a second. So I'm gonna start with spe spread spectrum. In spread spectrum, we use multiple channels and we transmit at 2.4 gigahertz. So there are two different ways to do spread spectrum. There is simultaneous and there is sequential. So simultaneous means things go at the same time. Sequential means things go in order, one after the other after the other. Simultaneous, we shorten to what we call frequency hopping. So what we're doing is if you ever play, played Frogger, which I did when I was a kid, if you ever played Frogger and you think of it as the little logs and you hop from log to log to log. So you're frequency hopping, you're hopping from log to log. In this case, we're switching channels. We're jumping from channel to channel. So we're hopping from channel to channel. There are 79 channels, but we do less than 0.4 seconds per channel at a time. So we jump from one channel to the other to the other and we bounce back and forth across these 79 different channels and send data packets. They do a little bit at a time and then they jump to another another um, uh, channel and they keep sending them across. So this is called frequency hopping and they all occur simultaneously, which means everything can kind of go and you don't have to worry as much about collisions because you're jumping channels. So it's not like one is in the same channel the whole time. In sequential, we have what we call direct sequencing. Direct sequencing is where the channels are split up and they don't overlap. So we take our um, megahertz, our, our 83 megahertz channels and we build them into 11 overlapping channels. Each of those channels is divided into three 22 megahertz channels. A little confusing, I know. 11 channels, and then each of those split into 22 megahertz, three channels of 22 megahertz each. Each one of those has a bandwidth of 22 megahertz. 
This can cause you to allow, if you have um, sequencing, direct sequencing, you can send across with a data rate of your 11 megabits or 33 megabits if you're going to use all three channels. So those three channels, you can do one at a time and do 11 megabits, or you can do all three channels and do the 33 megabits, depending on how your channel is. And they kind of give you some images here that kind of show you that frequency hopping and then the direct sequencing and how they look just a little bit differently. When we go over to the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM, and we shorten it to OFDM because holy cow, that's a mouthful. Four words there, technically three words there that I really want to talk about, orthogonal. So orthogonal is actually a term that can be used in any situation, which simply means to separate side by side over a range of values. So we're going to separate them out. And in a wireless application, orthogonal means that there's multiple separate radio channels that are side by side within the assigned band. So remember, we've given you a band, a frequency range, and inside that band, there are multiple channels that are separated out. So orthogonal, meaning separated, but side by side. Frequency dividing means that we are dividing that assigned frequency range into multiple narrow subfrequencies. So we're going to take that subfrequency, that 20 megahertz subfrequency that we've divided it into from orthogonal side by side, and then each one of those is going to be broken up into 52 300 kilohertz channels. So our channels are 300 kilohertz at this point, but there's 52 of them, and we've broken them up. Multiplexing. So we have orthogonal frequency division, we've divided our frequency, we put them side by side, and multiplexing. You're going to hear the word multiplexing a few different times in this course. Multiplexing is actually an electronics term. You combine content from different sources and transmit them together collectively over a single common carrier. So we are going to allow us to take multiple content, multiple data sources, and put them together and transmit them over the same carrier channel. So we divided the different channels, but each channel is broadcast separately and is multiplexed. Multiplexed meaning joined together multiple data points and sent across, but each one runs on its own. They're not sequential. They're not simultaneous. Each one is entirely on its own. It does its own thing. So the 5 gigahertz band, remember we talked about our 2.4 and our 5 gigahertz. So our spread spectrum runs at 2.4. Our OFDM runs at 5, so our 5 gigahertz, which is 100 megahertz bandwidth going into this 5 gigahertz band. It's split into 20 megahertz groups, so that 100 megahertz bandwidth is split into 5 20 megahertz, or in this case, 4 20 megahertz groups with separations between them so that you can find them. And then each one of those 20 is split into 52 300 gigahertz. If you take 52, multiply it by 300, you end up with less than that 20 so that there's spaces in between them, but you end up in that 20 megahertz grouping. OFDM can actually get data rates all the way up to 54 megabits per second. So we like it. And again, it's at that five megahertz grouping. Inside of our OFDM, we have different classifications. So there is an unlicensed National Information Infrastructure, UNII, Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure. And they break it into three different classifications. So you can have your 5.15 up to your 5.25, so 100 megahertz grouping. You can have your UNII2, which is 5.25 to 5.35, again, 100 megahertz grouping. And then your three, which is 5.725 to 5.825. Again, 100 megahertz. So remember, OFDM, 100 megahertz bands. They run in that five kilohertz or a gigahertz grouping. So we're at the 5.1, 5 to 5.25, 5.2 and 5.25 to 5.825. And these groupings are 100 megahertz groupings of different bandwidths that we can use. And each of these different channels can send their data. So each channel is split into 52, 300 kilohertz channels, and then you can send your data across there. Generally, each of those individual UNII classifications have a different application and a different power level. So the smallest one, the UNII, um, one has a power level of 50 megawatts 
two is 250 megawatts, and three is actually one watt. Um, I'm sorry, I said mega. Mega's wrong. Other direction, milla, milliwatt. I think it's a milliwatt. Um, please don't quote me on that. I feel like I have that wrong. We also do them for different purposes. So UNII 1 is usually used indoors. UNII 3 is usually used outdoors, uses more power. And then the one in the middle can be used in both situations. So the different ways that we can send radio waves with their techniques. So our spread, spread spectrum can either be our frequency hopping, our frogger, or our direct sequencing, sequential. Fre frequency hopping is simultaneous, sequential. Simultaneous meaning at the same time, sequential meaning one one after the other. They don't overlap. Um, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Orthogonal breaking up into groups. Frequency division, we're dividing the frequency. Multiplexing, we're sending multiple pieces of data. That is going to run in your five kilohertz or gigahertz. I don't know why I want to keep saying kilohertz. Gigahertz band in 100 megabit bandwidths in that five gigahertz band. Okay. Hopefully that kind of made some sense. When we network our computers in our radio wave based networking, this is how everything wireless is going to work. If you have a wireless access point in your home and you have your laptop and you're connected wirelessly, this is how it works. So you are networking the same way we would if we had a Cat5 cable and we plugged in our Ethernet ports um, on two different devices, you are networking with a wireless network. Obviously, a simple wireless network uses at least two computers and some version of a wireless network adapter. Your computer has to have a wireless network adapter to be able to work on a wireless network. If you have an older desktop that doesn't have a wireless adapter, you can go buy one. They're like 10 bucks. You go get them over. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them anywhere. Um, a little wireless network adapter that will allow your computer to receive and give network signals. And now you can work in your wireless network. Obviously, your wireless network needs to have a wireless access point, WAP, W-A-P, and it provides access between an actual cable, so your Cat5 cable or your fiber cable that comes in, and the actual wireless computers. So at some point in your network, you have to have your, your, your W-A-P, your wireless access point, has to be connected into a hardlined network that is going to go out into the universe. Um, unless it connects to a wireless access point or a wireless network, which is obviously possible. Most of us probably have a cable though that we're gonna be plugging in. When you have your wireless access point, every WAP has its own SSID, cell service set identifier. ID is ID, identifier, um, service set identifier. In this case, it is a case sensitive identifier for your network name. You could call it Netgear 42. You could call it My Network. You could call it Goober. It doesn't matter. But it is a unique case sensitive identifier for your network. So when you walk into someplace and you go search on your wireless phone for networks and you see these different SSIDs pop up, that's what they are. They are all referencing a singular WAP or wireless access point that is going to say this is where you're connecting to. If you have multiple wireless access points on the same network, they really should have all the same SSID. Kind of similar to a work group or a domain or something like that. So as I found in my house, I actually had two wireless access points with two different network names, which caused huge amounts of problems with my network. Amazingly, you set them both to the same network name and everything just gets prettier. Everything works nicely. I can walk from one side of my house to the other, switch over to the other wireless access point, and everything still stays connected and we're lovely. So if you are on the same network, if you are in the same location, you really ought to have the same SSID. That being said, you may choose to have a secondary SSID for secure packets, for um, guest networks with like a guest password or no password. That's fine. That, does, that shouldn't be the same SSID because you're setting up different securities and you're setting up different reasons for it to be there. But in general, the same network should have the same SSID. Wireless LAN controllers, they use what we call lightweight access point protocol, LW lightweight access A, PP, point protocol, access point protocol. So LWAPP. Whenever you see something with a P at the end, 89% of the time it's going to be a protocol. Just saying. If you ever get a question on your test that says which one of these is the protocol for this, 
I'm going to tell you now the answer is probably something that ends in a P. It may not. Don't quote me on it. But it probably is because protocols generally end in the word protocol, which always makes their acronym end in a P. So the lightweight access point protocol is used for the, WAN, uh, the wireless LAN controller to manage several wireless access points. If you are in a building with multiple wireless access points, you might log into Netgear Genie or one of these type of apps that is going to allow you to manage all of your wireless access points from a single interface. These are great, by the way, because it means you don't have to log into each wireless access point individually. You can use a WAN or W, a wireless LAN controller. Sorry, I'm getting my acronyms mixed. Um, to be able to manage all of them at the same time using this access point protocol, this lightweight access point protocol. Lightweight meaning that it, it isn't hyper convoluted with lots of data. It's not a big, huge, heavy access point protocol. It's lightweight. It's pretty easy. It's going to run on your computer nicely, and it's going to be probably web browser based. Um, and it's kind of lightweight. It's not a really deep, heavy. You're not using this to really overly configure everything. But you can get in there, and you can manage your several um, wireless access points. When you have a wireless network, you can choose to run it in what we call infrastructure mode or ad hoc mode. If you don't have a WAP present, you can have it in ad hoc mode where everything can kind of talk to each other because they all have um, network wireless network adapters and they can see each other and they can communicate, but there is no WAP in the middle managing everything. If you have one, if you have a WAP in the middle, that's infrastructure mode because we're going to have our WAP running everything and managing everything and everybody talks to him and he passes things back and forth from wherever he needs to go. Nobody talks to each other. They go through the WAP and then to wherever they need to go in the end. If you don't have a WAP present, you're going to have it in ad hoc mode. So these are the different types of modes that you're going to have for your radio waved networking. Just a quick note. So the picture over on the left hand side is a little wireless adapter that you can plug into your into your USB port that will give you wireless access. Your wireless access point on the right has its two omni directional um, antennas. So they go out in 360 degrees. And always nice to recognize those. Up at the very top, we talked about our service set identifier, SSID. There's a couple of things that we go with that. So our BSS, so these are acronyms that you're gonna to wanna to kind of memorize. Our BSS is our basic service set. So these are the wireless devices in our network. Our IBSS is our independent basic service set. These are your ad hoc networks. So BSS is gonna be your basic infrastructure mode where you just have your wireless de devices and they're all in a singular network. If they're independent, there is no WAP present. This is an ad hoc network. This is your independent basic service set, I, BSS, so keep that BSS. The last one is what we call an extended service set. This is if you have two or more wireless access points all using the same SSID. So you're in a school, you're in um, a school that has a big long hallway and you have five wireless access points going down the hallway. They could all have the same SSID, but they are in an extended service set because there is more than one wireless access point using the same SSID. So those three things, your basic service set, your independent, doesn't have a WAP, and then your extended, multiple WAPs, two plus WAPs using the same SSID. So now we finally get to introduce what is this IEE 802.11 that I've been talking about for a couple of, of chapters now. The IE211, IA, sorry, IEE 802.11 standard is the radio-based network standard. Again, if you go get your router and you look at the back of it, it's going to have an 802.11 standard on it somewhere. Okay, the 802.11s that run at 5 gigahertz. Technically, a G can run at 5 gigahertz. It generally doesn't. 5 gigahertz is generally just A and N. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in just a second. We're going to look over at the graph and explain a little bit more of that. Your lower frequencies at 2.4 gigahertz are going to be your B, your G, and also your N. So the N can be in either frequency, which is convenient if you want to run two networks. And you may have done this with your home network. If you just plugged in your Netgear router and you just ran with it and you realize there's a Netgear 34 and there's a Netgear 34-5G. 
and you never bothered to change it because you just didn't care. Um, that's because N can run at both 2.4 and 5G. So the 2.4 would be the first one and the 5G would be the other one and it'll be differentiated. 2.4 gigahertz has a 100 meter range. The 5 gigahertz roughly has a 50 meter range and it can't penetrate walls. So if you have a 5 gigahertz, it can't go through the walls as well as the 2.4 gigahertz does because they're walls and we can't see through them. The devices in the different standards at different frequencies generally do not interfere. So if I have a router running at 5, it's not going to interfere at a 2.4 and vice versa. So you may choose to say, I'm going to run my, my TV on the 2.4 gigahertz, but I'm going to run my computer at the 5 gigahertz, and I don't have to worry about any type of interference between those two. So the 802.11n incorporates the new concept that we call multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO technology, and it increased your data rate by two. So because we can have two, more than one thing going in, more than one thing coming out, it's going to allow your data rates to increase. Before I get into the second section of the 802.11a with the X in it, I'm going to go over to the graph or the, the chart and explain a little bit from the chart. So again, 802.11a, b, g, n. So those are the four that I want to talk about, a, b, g, n. And yes, we're going to go, why didn't they do a, b, c, d? Yeah, don't ask that. I, I don't ask questions like that. So a is going to run at 5 megahertz. b is going to run at 2.4. g technically can run at both. So it can run at 2.48 uh, or 5, and so can n. So those are the radio frequencies. Remember that frequency range we talked about back a couple of slides ago, the 5.15 to the 5.825, depending on which section you're going to be putting that in. So A can be from 515 over to 825. The B is in the 2.4 gigahertz, so it's going to do that 2.4 to the 2.48. But again, you'll see that the 5 is going to be in the same range roughly. So anytime you're going to see an 80211, in the 5 gigahertz range, you're going to do that 515 to 5825. If you're going to see an 802.11 in the 2.4 range, you're going to be the 2.4 to the 2.485 or 835. So those are the ranges that you're going to do for your frequency range. The data rates are going to vary, and they're going to vary depending on how your router or how your wireless-based um, radio wave is designed, whether you're going to have the 6 megabits or down to the 54 megabits. If I remember the study guide correctly, it's going to ask you what is the min and the maximums or something like that. You just want to keep it in your head. How fast can it go and how slow can it go? So what is the pos the, the minimum and the maximums? Try to keep those straight. Um, when you got into the 802.11, you actually had all the previous data rates and then up to 300 megabits, which was great. Um, because some people actually said at the 5 gigahertz range, you could get up to 600 megabits. Um, my 802.11n doesn't go up to 600 megabits, but it does go pretty fast. The different ranges, we talked about that as, as well. So the 5 gigahertz is generally at 50 meters. The 2.4 gigahertz is generally 100 meters. That being said, 802.11n broke all of that and said, Let's go 300 meters because we're just better than everybody else. So that's the cool one. You want that one. Finally, the transmission method. Remember, we talked about our transmission method, our OFDM, with our orthogonal frequency division multiplexing versus our DSS. Um, you're going to want to recognize which transmission method goes with which. So your 2.4 gigahertz, remember, those are your DSSs. Your 5 gigahertz, those are going to be your OFDMs. So recognizing the different standards and what their range is, what their data rate is, and how are they transmitted. Okay, let's go to the last little bulleted point in this slide. These are your 802.11a, and then we put an X. It's because it's an A, C, A, D, A, F, and A, J. That's not an I, it's a J. So A, C, A, D, A, F, and A, J. These are different types of um, standards that recognize different things. So when we introduced that MIMO, that multiple input, multiple output, and we were able to get our um, data rate up to one gigabit per second using eight of those MIMOs, that was our AC round. 
when we got it up to seven gigabits per second, one gigabit to seven gigabits per second, that was AD. So when we look at the standard, AC was one gigabit at eight MIMO, AD was up to seven gigabits. AF uses that VHF, UHF, if you're feeling really old when you know what those are, it's okay, range. So the UHF, VHF range is from 54 to 790 megahertz which is below everything we've been talking about. We've been talking about gigahertz. This actually is down in the VHF um, spectrum, which is weird because everything we've been doing is up in that higher gigahertz section. So we're going to jump down into the lower section into the VHF, UHF. Um, I always remember this one because AF uses the UHF. So the F from UHF, the F from VHF, that's the AF standard. So that one's how I always remember that one. And the last one, the AJ, actually uses a 45 gigahertz unlicensed spectrum. Generally, it's only used overseas, um, but it's at 45 gigahertz. It's in a completely different spectrum than everything else that we use. So that's kind of this, we're going to go out into the dark web. That's out in our, and not that this is the dark web, but that kind of concept. Everything else we do is in these 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and it's all controlled and, and understood. We're going to go out to the 45 gigahertz spectrum and hang out there. And that's the AJ. So 802.11 AJ. And that's usually, like I said, just for overseas. Um, the concept of channel bonding. So I throw it in this section because we do use channel bonding in some of our frequencies and it's definitely in the book. So I want to make sure you understood this term. If you have two or more links that are combined for the purposes of redundancy, fault tolerance, or increased throughput, we call that channel bonding. So sometimes for fault tolerance, making sure that you don't lose anything, don't lose any packets in the way, um, or redundancy, we want to have it sent twice for the purposes of redundancy, we use something called channel bonding, where we use multiple channels at the same time to send multiple pieces of data. When we were talking about access methods with our fiber or with our basic cables, um, our basic cat cables, we talked about carrier sends multiple access with collision detection and with collision avoidance. Wireless has to use collision avoidance. They can't use collision detection that we can use in wired networks because of the aspect of a wireless network. If you look at the image that's over on your left-hand side, we have a singular network hanging out at the top that has a wireless access point and two computers. And at the bottom, we have another wireless access point and two computers, and we have another wireless access point in the middle. And Mostly all four kind of fit into the wireless access point at the top or in the middle, um, but otherwise it's two and two. Because you don't always have the ability to see every computer that is sending data all at the same time with a wireless access point, we have to use collision avoidance. If we try to use collision detection, we don't have access to all of the computers that are in our range. So there could be computers outside of our range, but we still need to know whether we're gonna cause collisions. So we use a collision avoidance with wireless, specifically because of that concept, there may not be an overlap. Essentially, there may be two computers that are in different ranges. There is no overlap, and therefore they can't see each other, they can't make the decision. So with a CSMA CA, collision avoidance version, which is what we do with wireless, we follow four steps before we actually send our data. Well, four steps to send our data. The first thing we do is we immediately send something to the wireless access point and say, I want to send something, a request to send. So I'm going to call my wireless access point from my laptop and I'm going to say, hey, I want to send something. And then we're just sitting, wait. And my wireless access point is either say, no, don't send anything. There's traffic right now. It's totally busy. Just hang on. We say, okay, cool. Then we send them another request to send. Hey, just telling you, I want to go send something. And they're like, no, not yet. We're still busy. I'm like, oh, fine. Hey, I'd like to go send something now. And they're like, cool, you're clear to send. CTS, clear to send. And I'm like, yes, I can finally send it. So then I send my data after I receive a clear to send. So get my clear to send, send it back to them with my data. Here's my data. And then they send me back. Cool. We acknowledge it, ACK. We acknowledged that you sent your data. 
this is the CSMA CA process. And your computer will do, the, obviously these are in milliseconds, the time that it takes to do this. I say, I wanna send something. They're like, no, I'd like to send something. They say no. And finally they say, okay, cool, go ahead and send it now. This is how the collision avoidance carry a sense multiple access works. If you have um, a lot of devices in a singular location, more than your WAP can actually handle, we call that overcapacity. So what can happen is if you are in, um, say, a room with 20 students and um, all 20 of those students are trying to send data to the same time, they're all trying to download the same YouTube video because they're all watching the same YouTube video. They want to get something, so they're all sending requests. Um, and if they do that, they can the, the wireless access point can get overloaded. It's like, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. Stop asking me for things. I'm busy. You're busy. You're busy. And nobody's getting any response because everybody's getting a busy. That's called overcapacity. The answer with that is you want to add another wireless access point to handle it. You want to add somebody else to handle the overload of too many, too many devices. What you can do, by the way, if you have the ability to manage your wireless access points, is go through and build a site survey. Walk through your building with your wireless, um, whether you're Netgear Genie or some sort of, of um, program that's going to measure signal strength. Walk through your building and recognize where is the signal strength strongest and where is it the weakest? Where does it need to be filled? And then you can choose to move your WAPs around so that they balance that signal. They balance it so that multiple people can access everything they need all at the same time. So we call that a site survey. You survey your site the same way you would if you walked out into a field and you wanted to survey your field and say, I'm going to put a post here and a post here, however I'm going to do this. Same thing with, I'm going to put a wireless access point here and one on the other side. I've spent a lot of time talking about the 802.11, but there are other wireless standards. I just don't talk about them as much. They're not as important. Um, the 802.11 is just kind of the standard that we talk about, but there are others. So we're going to talk a little bit about some other wireless standards. So first is the 802.15. Remember, each of these standards is an IEEE standard where they just pretty much say, this is how we're going to handle this type of a situation. So your 15 is going to be your wireless personal area network. This may just be your home. This may just be you individually in your home. This could be your phone, your laptop, your iPod, your Xbox, your printer, and your desktop computer all in your office. That would be a wireless personal area network. And there are different rules for that, different standards for that. There is a concept called Zigbee which is generally used for residential appliances. So if you got one of those cool coffee makers that is a residential appliance that sends you an email when something occurs, that runs on the 802.15 standard. If you have the wireless water softener or the wireless refrigerator and they send you emails and updates, that's on the, on the 802.15. That's where Zigbee is. 802.16 is generally what we call our broadband wireless access. This is the um, standard that's going to handle connecting your LAN with your wireless technology. So where is the LAN connected to instead of within our individual LAN, within our individual wireless network, connecting the LANs together. So how do we handle that with whatever backbone we're using for that? So we use the 802.16 for our broadband wireless access, so our backbone between LANs. And then, of course, we have our Bluetooth. Everyone's got a Bluetooth device. You've got your watch, you've got your phone, everything's Bluetooth, your mouse, your keyboard. Original Bluetooth 3.0 version only had a radius of 10 meters. Since then, it's gotten bigger. So you may have noticed that your watch goes a lot further than 10 meters than it used to. Um, originally, we referred to them as a personal area network or a PAN. The same interference with the 802.11 but it doesn't interfere with the 802.11b because there are different formats. So Bluetooth and 802.11b do not interfere. So we're good with that. That might be why some cases you're going to inter introduce an 802.11b for your router rather than an A because you want to keep it in a different band so that it doesn't, um, it doesn't argue with your Bluetooth. Bluetooth versions 3.0 was originally, originally at 25 megabits per second, 10 meters, and then it's built up to Bluetooth 5.0. If you're looking at a Bluetooth device and you're looking at it going, do I want 3.0 or 5.0? 
in 90% of the cases, choose the larger number. In this case, 5.0 is at 50 megabits per second, and it can go as far as 240 meters, which means that you can be in your house and you can walk all the way out to your garage and maybe onto your front porch and then go out into your yard and it still accesses. I mean, that's like 800 feet. That's a pretty significant distance. Um, there's a couple of standards over on the right-hand side, the 802.15 breakdowns, so your low speed, um, your 802.11 and 802.15 devices on the 2.4 gigahertz band, high speed with different data rates, and so on and so forth. The four listed in blue, these are different types of standards and different types of devices that we're going to be using. We are not going to be using, but we're going to be talking about so if you have a fitness tracker, your Fitbit or something like that, or your medical monitoring or those little devices that you can have around your neck that are constantly checking things, um, those are your medical monitoring or your fitness trackers. And they generally use either the Ant or the Ant Plus um, versions. So that's what they use. Your RFID, your radio field um, identifier, uses EM fields with chips. So when you think of an RFID, Think about a little chip that's going to be attached to a cow's ear or a dog's collar, little chips, and you can use those and they emit an EM field that can be used to track and follow people around. Near field communication, NFC, is the kind of thing that's on your phone where you do your Google Pay and you can run it up against the, um, the checkout counter and it connects. They have to be right next to each other. So near field communication, they have to be right next to each other, but they can also be the chips on the card or something like that as long as they can get close enough. These are within inches, like you have to be right there to be able to use it. And the last is our Z-Wave, which is our home automation. This again gets back into those residential appliances, your doorbell, your ring thing, um, things like that that are gonna take care of your automation on your home. Obviously, with radio waves and with wireless, we have to talk about cell phones. So our cellular technology, these are based on radio waves, which connect to multiple areas. We break down those areas by calling them cells, hence the word cellular phone, cell phone. Um, we break them in and call them cells. So each cell or specific geographic area has both a transmitter and a receiver. So it has both. So it has to be able to transmit information and it has to be able to receive it. Sometimes it receives it and immediately retransmits it. That's how it works. So each cell can communicate with the other cells that it can see via either microwave or telephone lines. So you can use microwaves or you can use the basic phone lines to be able to communicate. But the cell is going to receive your phone call, is going to receive your text message from your phone and either transmit it to another cell or transmit it through the phone lines to some other location. With cellular technology, we have introduced SIM cards, the subscriber identity module or the card that you put in your cell phone that says, this is who I am. That little SIM card is going to follow you around. That's attached to your phone number and your account and keeping you all straight. So if you break your phone, make sure you keep your SIM card if you wanna keep your um, identity information. We also have a personal unlocking key, which is a P-U-K or puck. And this is used if you forgot your pin. So if you forgot your pin, I don't know why you would do that, but if you did, you put in some sort of a pin, you added a new pin, you forgot what it was, your kid broke it. Um, you can have a personal unlocking key that will reset your forgotten pin. We also have an integrated circuit card identifier. This is a unique serial number that's assigned to the individual SIM card. So the serial number and the SIM card go together and that ICCC, sorry, ICC ID, that integrated circuit card identifier, is going to identify you with a specific serial number so that if someone takes your same card and puts it in different device, you would know that. So you know the serial number of the device, you know the serial number of your SIM card, they should go together. There are five cellular networks that we refer to. Our GSM, which is our global system for mobile, that's your basic 2G. 2G, way down at 2, yeah, it's a long time ago. So your basic 2G. Your edge is your enhanced data rates for GSM evolution because we like to do that. So enhanced data rates for GSM evolution, edge. They're between two and three gigahertz. Your UMTS is your universal mobile telecommunications. This is your 3G standard. And your CDMA which is your code division multiple access. It's also on a 3G. T2 
TDMA is our time division multiple access, which is on a 2G. So CDMA is better than TDMA, um, both of which are pretty much being covered by 4G, which is not even covered right this, at this point. So for the purposes of memorizing acronyms and understanding that the different cellular networks have an acronym and what those mean, you need to know these. Otherwise, they are not significantly important. You are not going to be asked on your Network Plus test to tell me what the acronym for UMTS stands for. Be cool if you memorized it, but it's not 100% necessary. So that is your basic cellular technology. The image on the bottom right over here is basically how do you get a text message going from one point to another. And you're actually going to go through a phone company. So you are going to send a message. You can do it from your phone or from your computer. It's going to go up to the internet through your ISP, and then it's going to go back down to the phone company, your AT&T, your Verizon, which is going to send the paging service to your phone. That's how text messages work. I've kind of thrown out the generic, there is microwave transmission, but I haven't talked about it yet. So microwaves generally have a wavelength between one millimeter and three centimeters. So if you think about how far their wavelength is, remember the wavelength is in a sine curve from point zero up, down, and back up to the same point zero. That's the length of the wave. Frequencies in microwaves are usually between 1 gigahertz and 300 gigahertz, which is a pretty large sex, spe sex spectrum of frequencies that microwaves can run at. Microwaves can run through wireless devices or through satellites. So satellites, generally, if you've never thought about a satellite, satellites are roughly 22.3 um, or 22,300 miles or 35K above the Earth. They sit in geosynchronous orbit above the Earth and they just hang out there running at 68 miles per hour, which is essentially the same amount of time and it goes around in a 24 hour series. So these are your satellites. Um, you can send microwave transmissions up to your satellite and back. Problem with satellites. The time it takes to get from Earth up 22,000 miles and then back down causes this thing that we call propagation delay. It's a latency. It takes time. Even going at the speed of light, you still take time. Um, it takes some time to get up there and back, and we call that propagation delay. It's just the latency that is caused going up to the satellite and coming back down. If you are doing data, it's not as obvious. Data is going to run and it's going to be fine, and you probably aren't going to notice the half a second delay in your propagation delay. However, if you're in a phone call and you have to wait a second between every time somebody else talks and you hear them, it's going to get irritating. So phone conversations, this propagation delay is much more prominent. It's, it's more obvious. Generally, one-way transmissions use buffering to prevent your jitter, prevent your delays. So we're going to go ahead and run a video, and it's going to go through microwaves, and it's going to go up to the satellite and come back down, and we're going to wait five seconds before we even start it. And we're going to buffer for five solid seconds, and that way, if it takes a second for another propagation delay, we don't notice. We've got five seconds to, uh, buffered, and we're good. You've probably already thought about the advantages and disadvantages of wireless. Advantages, obviously, it can be cost effective, it isn't as disruptive, and it's much more convenient. Anybody who's ever used wireless knows that there's a huge convenience of having wireless technologies. However, atmosphere can cause problems. Lightning, sunspots, yes, sunspots are an actual thing, and they can cause problems, especially with satellites. Um, lightning, storms, anything like that, that can cause problems with wireless. The more important one is security you're sending out data in a wireless fashion. It's not wired. So anybody who is able to absorb that or receive that, there's a security risk. So you want to be careful with wireless technology on things that are definitely security risk factors. If you can, if you're in your home and you're using your home network, you're probably safe. But if you're using wireless outside of your home at the Starbucks, be aware of the security risk of using wireless technology. So on that note, we are going to talk a little bit about wireless security. And this is the last slide for this chapter if you were starting to get bored. So wireless security. We talk about wireless security in the 802.1x authentication. So we do our 802.1 authentication and encryption. So the 802.1x. If you see 802.1x, we're talking about security. So that's, a, that's an easy catch when something says which of these standards goes along with security is an 802.1x. Um, 
Authentication is trying to figure out who you are, authenticating that you are the right person. 802.1x is the standard for wireless networks, and generally you can use what we call an extensible authentication protocol, EAP, or the better version, which is PEAP. So it's still extensible. It's just, I don't know if it's preferred. I can't remember what the exact acronym is. Um, but the P, progressive, who knows? It's some sort of P, um, extensible authentication protocol. And this is used to determine who you are. So we are going to figure out the authentication of making sure you are who you say you are. Then we do the second half, which is the encryption. We want to be able to keep things private. And even though I said generally using wireless in your home is probably safe and outside probably is a little bit more risky, we can still involve encryption. So the different levels of encryption, you are going to start with the least safe, which is called the wired equivalent priv uh, privacy, WEP, wired equivalent privacy. This was the first protocol that we did for wireless um, encryption, and it was supposed to be as safe as being wired. Okay, it's still wireless, so okay, we don't really put a huge amount of security into wired because we can see where the cord is going, so we're safe. But wireless equivalent was the first one that was offered. It is not the safest. If you can avoid WEP, avoid it. It's not the greatest. Next, we came up with what we call Wi-Fi protected access, WPA. WPA uses what we call TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, which is 128-bit key, to protect your access. WPA was fine, but it wasn't good enough. So then we moved up to WPA2, Wi-Fi Protected Access 2. This uses an advanced encryption standard, AES. It uses counter mode cipher block chaining message authentication code protocol. Yeah, and somehow they shortened it to CCMP. We're just gonna go with it, we're gonna believe them. I think it was counter, then the cipher, no, counter mode, cipher block, chaining message, there's like three C's in there. Um, and then message authentication code protocol. Anyway, they shorten it to CCMP, but it is a way of making sure that it is safe. For right now, WPA2 is the best choice. In a year, they might come up with something better. But in general, you always want to go with the better of the choices. So if you have the option between WEP, wired equivalent, and WPA, you're gonna pick WPA. If you have the option between WPA and WPA2, you're gonna pick WPA2. I could probably guarantee you that the next one they come out with, if they do WPA3, is going to be better than WPA2, it's just not there yet. So that gives you some things on authentication and encryption. So for your security, remember if 802.1X is going to be your security, your authentication, your encryption. Okay, so for your assignments for this chapter, I'm gonna have you do the study guide. You can do the review questions if they help, if you need to know whether you got the answers right, feel free to let me know. And we're gonna have you do 16, 17, and optionally 18. 18 is actually a kind of fun lab, um, which I'll talk about in a second. So 16 and 17 are going to be using a network adapter and configuring your wireless router. You can choose to do this with your personal wireless router, assuming you have one, or you can choose to use Packet Tracer, which will allow you to do as well. The important thing is for you to see what the configuration is on a wireless router. And they're they're similar. It doesn't matter if you have a Cisco router, Netgear router, um, Linksys router, they all pretty much follow the same lines. So it's gonna be very similar. You're gonna do 17, which is troubleshooting your wireless connections. How can you troubleshoot it? Can you figure out that? And so it's gonna walk you through some troubleshooting choices. 18, like I said, it's kind of a fun one. If you have two devices, one is like a wireless laptop and the other is like a hard-lined desktop, something like that. You can pick up your wireless laptop and try to send data back and forth between your device and your hardline device and see what the distance from your router does to that. You may find it doesn't make a difference at all and you may find that it makes a significant difference. How far away are you from your router and what is the time difference? So you're measuring your throughput versus your, your distance. And I think it's kind of fun lab. Um, you can also do it, um, I, I, yeah, I really don't think you can do this one using Packet Tracer because I don't think you can measure that distance and have it tell you the difference. Um, so go ahead and fill those out and set, submit them. Um, the study mate for chapter four is up there. You're welcome to use it. And then don't forget to take your chapter four notes. I hope this chapter on wireless really got you excited about all the great things in wireless and maybe recognized a couple of those 802.11's concepts that you may have seen but didn't really understand. 
Please let me know if you have any questions. You can always put them in the comments or um, send me a chat and I will see you next week.